On May 11, 1996, ValueJet, Flight 592, crashed into the Florida Everglades shortly after takeoff, killing all 109 people on board. In the wake of this tragedy, the FAA, in partnership with industry, embarked upon an intensive 90-day safety review, and system safety was born into the FAA. There is no doubt that we have made major improvements in the way that we serve the public, in the way that we do our own business, and in the way that air carriers are now designing their systems and operating uh, as, as part of the air transportation system. Uh, I believe that air carriers are safer because of what we have done. Federal aviation regulations are the minimum standards required to operate an air carrier. However, regulations alone do not ensure safety. Accidents can occur even when all regulations are followed. The Federal Aviation Administration has developed and implemented an unprecedented proactive approach to airline safety and surveillance, which is revolutionizing the aviation industry. The approach? System safety. Title 49 of the United States Code, Section 44702B, requires air carriers to operate at the highest degree of safety. It is the air carrier's responsibility to provide a safe operation to the traveling public. 14 CFR 121-133 requires that each certificate holder prepare and keep current a manual for the use and guidance of flight, ground operations, and management personnel in conducting its operations. 14 CFR 121-135 requires that each manual used in conducting its operations must include instructions and information necessary to allow the personnel concerned to perform their duties and responsibilities with a high degree of safety. Many of our regulations exist today because of accidents that have occurred in the past. Our regulations exist, as we know them today, to help prevent accidents. System safety not only allows a carrier to comply with the regulations, but in addition enables them to enhance their level of safety to a higher degree. The FAA has determined that the principles of system safety built inherently into an air carrier's corporate culture and manual system is operating with the highest degree of safety. The FAA's system safety-based approach to air carrier oversight includes the validation of regulatory requirements, a review of entire programs, not just portions, the application of safety attributes, and the application of risk management. If an applicant or an operator incorporates system safety, they will be inherently safer. Um, it is a, a stretch over and above uh, the specific regulatory requirements that we have uh, for uh, operators to com comply with. So um, <clears throat> that, that gives system safety its importance to us and to them, more importantly. A system is defined as a group of interrelated processes, which are a composite of people, software, facilities, equipment, procedures, tools, and materials. All of these composites operate in a specific environment to perform a specific task or mission requirement for an air carrier. Each part needs to operate efficiently in order to ensure that the entire system works. The ideal level of safety is freedom from danger or harm. However, we cannot operate airplanes and be completely free from danger. Since we will have inherent risks, safety is defined as the quality of a system that allows the system to function under predetermined conditions with an acceptable level of risk. A system safety-based approach considers and evaluates the organization as a whole, a singular functioning operation, not just the separate parts or departments within the system. An airline system is comprised of seven distinct air carrier systems. Aircraft configuration control is the system by which an air carrier maintains the physical condition of the aircraft and associated components. Manuals control the information and instructions that define and govern the air carrier's activities. Flight operations is the system pertaining to aircraft movement. Personnel training and qualifications is the system by which air carrier personnel are trained and qualified. 
Route Structures provides guidance for maintenance of air carrier facilities on approved routes. Airmen and crew member flight, rest, and duty time prescribes time limitations for air carrier employees. Technical administration addresses other aspects of certification and operation, such as key management personnel. Each of these systems can be broken down even further to subsystems. For example, Flight Operations 3.0 has a subsystem 3.1, Air Carrier Programs and Procedures, but this is still too broad to review. We have to reach a working level and break it down even further. 3.1.6, Exit Seating, is a good example of an element or process. 3 represents the system, Flight Operations. 1 represents the subsystem, Air Carrier Programs and Procedures. And 6 represents Exit Seating, the working element. When we reach this level, each element can be reviewed for regulatory compliance and the presence of safety attributes. The FAA has identified 96 safety critical elements or processes within an air carrier system. The FAA has developed over 100 data collection tools, or DCTs, which help inspectors assess the quality of these elements or processes within an air carrier system. These tools assess both Part 121 and 119 regulatory requirements and inclusion of safety attributes in air carriers programs. There are six safety attributes in each of these tools. It's important to remember that in addition to the specific regulatory requirements covered in the DCTs, the applicant or air carrier is also responsible for the applicable parts of other regulatory requirements. For example, Part 91, 65, 39, 43, 25, 21, 172, 173, 1500, and 382 are some of the regulations which may apply to an airline's operation. The pertaining regulations in each of these parts must also be incorporated into their system. In this chart, each system, subsystem, and element is clearly identified. System safety is the application of special technical and managerial skills used to identify, analyze, assess, and control hazards and risks, and facilitate cultural changes within an organization. System safety views the entire system as an integrated whole. The focus is no longer on one department or subsystem within an organization. Today, it's all about the big picture. Do the departments interface and communicate with each other? Do they have technical expertise and a culture of safety among their people within the system? In the past, we did it by specialty. Operations looked at their part, maintenance looked at their part, cabin safety, dispatch, and so on. Now we look at the entire system. Using interfaces, we try to bring all of these areas together. The organizational culture represents shared safety values and beliefs. A good safety culture always starts, then flows from the top. It's an attitude and philosophy which must be incorporated into the entire organization. Top to bottom personal attitude towards safety. Top management appreciates and requests independent safety assessments. No management pressure to compromise. No fear of retribution. And freedom to raise and debate issues. An effective safety culture is a commitment to safety, a shared perception, and good open communication. From the top down, if, if all the key management personnel were to adopt this, from, from the chief executive officer and so on, down to the mechanic level, down to the uh, ramp personnel who move the aircraft around, that system safety will carry through that whole organization. There are three fundamental system safety principles to keep in mind. Safety cannot be inspected into a system. Safety must be designed into a system. And hazard and associated risk identification, risk analysis, assessment, and management are critical aspects of system safety. System safety is a job accomplished from the inside out. The FAA cannot inspect safety into your system. You, as an operator, must introduce it to your procedures and people. 
Every aspect of your organization must include a system safety approach. The executive company management, the employees, the FAA inspectors themselves will get together and uh, take a proactive approach towards system safety. It's a philosophy that has to be constantly uh, scrutinized. It's a philosophy that has to be constantly uh, energized and uh, looked after each and every single day. Let's take a brief look at hazard identification and its associated risk, analysis, assessment, and management. First, we need to define hazards and risks. A hazard exists in the present. It is a condition, event, or circumstance that could lead or contribute to an unplanned or undesired event. Risk exists in the future. It is the expression of the impact of an undesired event in terms of event severity and event likelihood. In other words, how likely is it that the undesired event is going to occur? And how bad is it going to hurt if it does? A simple example of hazard and risk would maybe be a situation in an air carrier where they failed to have the regulatory requirement to obtain, maintain, and distribute current, air current aeronautical data uh, for flight crews. The hazard would be a situation where, following surveillance and the reading of the manual system, the procedures were not there. It was not known whether the crews or not did in fact receive the current charts. The failure to receive those charts may very well result in an accident. A risk statement is a forward-looking approach to safety. It's a way of looking down the road at what could happen if a problem or condition is not addressed. Problems don't simply disappear. Although the concern may be minimal now, if ignored, these issues could become serious. Here is an example of an FAA risk statement. First, identify the hazard, which is a condition that could lead to an undesired event or consequence. For example, flight crew personnel do not consistently acknowledge maintenance discrepancies. The consequence is what could result from this oversight. Flights could depart with passengers on board where aircraft discrepancies were not corrected or recorded in the logbook. Next, we have to analyze the condition to determine the severity of the potential consequence and what is the likelihood of the consequence actually occurring. Once we make these determinations, we can assess the overall level of risk. The FAA uses a risk assessment matrix to determine the overall level of risk. For example, in this situation, it will probably occur often, and the severity will be medium which means there could be possible FAR violations, breakdown of an air carrier system, or potential for moderate damage to an aircraft. Our next step is the management of the risk. There are several different actions the FAA team could take to ensure that the applicant or certificate holder controls or eliminates hazards and mitigates the risk. It is important to remember that the risk is the air carriers and they have the responsibility to take action to address the risk. Once a concern is addressed, no matter how insignificant, the action taken is a proactive approach to safety. If we discover that flight crews are not writing up aircraft discrepancies in the aircraft logbook, um, an action that we could take is looking at the manual system of the air carrier making sure that they have a policy and procedures in place to guide the flight crew in how to address discrepancies of the aircraft and how to record the discrepancies in the logbook. If we find that the manual system is deficient in this regard in that they don't have po a policy and procedure in place, we would go to the carrier, identify this with them, and require that they do put a policy and procedure in place. The FAA uses risk worksheets throughout the certification process to identify hazards and ensure the applicant eliminates or controls them and mitigates the risk. Once an applicant becomes an air carrier, the principal inspectors will use these same tools to develop work surveillance programs. Risk statements are our primary source uh, of information when we're designing a surveillance plan for a carrier. Uh, if we have not identified many risk in, uh, say, the training section, but we have identified several in the de-icing area, uh, obviously then we would be able to design the surveillance plan around that and focus more surveillance on the de-icing area. Risk obviously can't be entirely eliminated. 
but the FAA system safety based approach to air carrier oversight provides tools to recognize hazards and effectively manage and mitigate risks. Always take a proactive approach to safety before a serious situation arises. The FAA encourages each carrier to establish its own internal risk management process. The FAA uses risk management processes to help in its oversight role. However, we all need to realize that the air carrier must take action to mitigate risk to an acceptable level. The goal of safety is to transform risks that are inherent in every human activity to lower, more acceptable levels. This is risk management. An air carrier must establish programs that ensure regulatory compliance and includes safety attributes. This may be accomplished using a variety of available tools. Not just the regulations themselves, but FAA guidance materials such as advisory circulars, handbook bulletins, and orders. We've also developed specific tools for use in the certification process. And there are numerous websites offering the most current information and guidance. In establishing programs, it is important to establish a point of contact within your organization for each element. Someone who has the authority to change or revise that program, and who has the responsibility for the quality of that program. There are six safety attributes incorporated into each of the 96 elements. These attributes take a who, what, where, when, and how approach. The authority attribute is the organization or person who has the power to establish and modify the course of action over a process. This is usually the individual who wrote or developed the process and who can make changes to the program. The second attribute, responsibility, is the organization or person who owns the process and is answerable for the quality of the process. This individual has the overall responsibility for a particular process, but may not actually have developed or written it. Authority can be delegated, where responsibility cannot. The intent of this second attribute is to identify the highest level individual responsible for the quality of the process. In any organization, there is rarely only one individual in charge. For example, the authority to establish and modify an airline's carry-on baggage program may be the director of in-flight, but the overall responsibility for the carry-on baggage program may be the director of operations. Procedures is the documented or prescribed methods of accomplishing a process. There is a distinct difference between policy and procedure. Fundamental questions regarding air carrier procedures are, do they work as written? Are they consistent between and among manuals? Do they provide a level of safety? Let's take a look at the carry-on baggage program again. The policy is all carry-on baggage must be properly stowed for takeoff and landing. How is this accomplished? Do the air carrier's written procedures provide employees with instructions to ensure regulatory and safety requirements are met? Controls are the checks or restraints that are designed into a process to ensure a desired result. Essentially, a method to ensure procedures are followed. Here are a few control methods for the carry-on baggage program. A sizing device used at the ticket counter and or gate. The agent checks at the gate and then flight attendant at the aircraft door for oversized baggage. Ticket jackets may give passengers information regarding carry-on baggage requirements. Gate agent and flight attendant carry-on baggage announcements. Flight attendant checks before aircraft door is closed that all carry-on baggage and overhead bins are closed and secure. Process measures are designed to identify, analyze, and document potential problems within a process and help improve those processes. The questions to ask here are, is it working? And how do you know it's working? This is risk management. You may have a procedure that you've put in place in an airline, and you think it's the best procedure out there, 
And when it actually is out there and in place, oops, it doesn't work, and you have to make changes. And that's where um, the, the airline can now take um, what happens out there, make their changes, look to see, is what we put in place actually working? If it's not, they make changes. Here are some process measure examples for the carry-on baggage program. First, do you have an audit program to evaluate the carry-on baggage process? If so, how does it work? When is it accomplished, and where is it documented? Another process measure might include a procedure to identify hazards or conditions as they occur. There could be a procedure in place in their manual that says if you get two or more passengers that, that bring excess baggage or try to board, you are to write a, an in-flight report. The flight attendant writes a report, turns it in, the director of in-flight looks at it. Now there are procedures in place where this report now is forwarded to the director of, of safety and perhaps the director of stations. Well, the director of stations gets this report and says, well, you know, I've just gotten a report a week ago with the very same problem. That would alert uh, that particular department that there may be a problem out there. Interfaces are used to identify and manage the interactions among processes. Written policies and procedures that are interrelated and located in different manuals must be consistent and mutually complementary. The process identifies potential interfaces, methodologies to document interfaces, and develops communication and feedback among interfaces. For interfaces to be effectively managed, it is not only important to identify what the interfaces are, but it is imperative to document their specific location within the manual system. Good organizational communication among different departments and processes is imperative to safe operations. If the mechanic communicates with maintenance control, he handles the problem, he also has to communicate with dispatch to let dispatch know there is an operational limitation on his aircraft at this point. He can react. So it, it demonstrates how if the two groups do not communicate with each other, how a breakdown can occur. And when we talk system safety, we are now looking at the entire operation of that system. The FAA's data collection tools can be used by the inspector, applicant, and or air carrier in evaluating their systems. The FAA inspector uses them to evaluate a new applicant and to conduct continued surveillance on an existing operator. Or they can be used by industry to develop and ensure that their manual system and procedures meet the regulatory requirements and include safety attributes. A safety attribute inspection tool, or SAI, is used by the inspector to evaluate a manual system. The purpose of an SAI is to ensure that a particular system element or process within an air carrier's operation incorporates safety by inclusion of the six safety attributes and that it also complies with the applicable regulations. Element performance inspection, or EPIs, are designed to determine if an air carrier adheres to its written procedures and controls for each system element. In other words, is the carrier following their procedures? And are those procedures accomplishing the desired result, as well as regulatory compliance and safety? Simply said, an SAI is a, a design tool that uh, the FAA uses to ensure that system safety principles are designed into an air carrier system, whereas an EPI is an element performance inspection where an inspector would use that tool to go out and evaluate the functionality of procedures and system safety concepts in a, an operator that's up and running. Let's look at one example of an SAI data collection tool. SAI 3.1.5 is used to evaluate the carry-on baggage program. The specific regulatory requirements, guidance materials, and safety attributes are all identified in this SAI. Each of the SAI data collection tools contain references to all the regulatory requirements and guidance for that element or process. Although the regulations may vary, safety attribute requirements are consistent for each SAI. The safety assessment process is used to ensure, demonstrate, verify, and document that an air carrier's programs and processes integrate safety and regulatory compliance into their system.
System safety-based certification and surveillance programs help the FAA be proactive rather than reactive by identifying hazards and their associated risks before they become serious problems and ensuring that the air carrier manages its own risks. It also increases the inherent level of organizational safety and ultimately reduces the probability of an accident, incident, or violation. Again, the FAA's system safety-based approach to air carrier oversight includes the validation of regulatory requirements, a review of entire programs, not just portions, the application of safety attributes, and the application of risk management. System safety is good business, a philosophy that translates into profit for the carrier and its shareholders. There is a cost to safety. There always will be a cost to safety. Uh, and I think it's an uh, aspect of uh, management to keep a uh, keen eye on the expense from that standpoint and uh, to make sure that it is an investment that is worth uh, taking. Air carriers are, are in business to make a profit, and, and that's a necessary part of any business. But safety is so important that, um, that any, any degradation in safety, either in the beginning or later, will show up on, on the profit sheet. So uh, this is both good safety sense and good business sense. And again, it's an opportunity to get it right from the beginning. Earlier business practices and procedures would not likely be as safe or effective in today's global marketplace. We have learned a great deal from tragedies like ValueJet and the comprehensive 90-day safety review that ensued. We took a long, hard look at what wasn't working and what needed to change. We're looking at maintenance, we're looking at load planning, we're looking at gate agents, we're looking at every single task from the highest element to the lowest element. Whether it's a new operator or an existing operator updating their fleets or adding new aircraft, we encourage them to use the system safety process. There are over 2,000 regulations that, that an air carrier must meet in order to be certificated by us. So that certificate means a lot when we issue it. I mean, it has high value because of the process that the carrier has undergone to, to attain our approval, in essence. And it's our stamp of approval that is the public's assurance that the air carrier is safe. The FAA, in partnership with industry, has developed a safer, more effective way to do business. One that minimizes risk, ensures regulatory compliance, and standardizes our industry.